Hello out there. Today is Monday, June 8th, 2020. My name is Matt Fury, and you are listening to The Rough Cut. All right, my friends. Great to be hanging out with you again. Uh, I'm sure that no matter where you are in the world, you probably have a lot on your mind, a lot of things to consider and a lot of things to do. And amidst all that, here we are together again, ostensibly to talk about our shared love of the visual art of storytelling and the craft and career of editing. And of course, we do that. That's the core of of what we talk about here on The Rough Cut. But what we accomplish from doing that, from getting together like we do and having a conversation about anything is a familiarity and an appreciation for people we might not otherwise ever have had the chance to learn about. And on this show, this podcast, right along with you, I get to meet a lot of people I didn't know before. Our guest on the show today, editor Yana Griskaya, is a perfect example. I knew of her. I knew and appreciated her work, but I had never spoken to her before, never got to hear her story and her perspective, most importantly, in her own words. And I am very grateful that now I have. But there's even more to it than that. A big part of why I do this in the first place is I get to meet a lot of you, at least in email form. And who knows, maybe someday in person. And I get to learn about what a lot of you are dealing with and where you're at in your lives and careers. And I don't even have to leave my house to do that. I sure would like to. uh, But either way, you just can't replace or replicate the experience of getting to see the world from someone else's point of view. And honestly, isn't that what storytelling is all about? So that's my convoluted way of thanking you for going on this little journey with me. A journey that today leads us to Staten Island and the home of four very funny vampires. Yes, that's a thing. A thing called What We Do in the Shadows. This TV series is just about to wrap its second season on FX and Hulu. And What We Do in the Shadows is based on the film of the same name. Uh, It's the undead child of Taika Waititi and Jemaine Clement. You know those guys. Uh, Jojo Rabbit, Flight of the Concords, Many other bizarrely brilliant comedic ventures. But whether you know them or not, you really need to meet Yana Griskaya, because her considerable talents as an editor, and now a director, play a big part in why what we do in the shadows, amongst other films and TV shows that she's done, are as beloved as they are by their fans. There is a lot to say about Yana, but you want to hear it from her, not me. But I'll say this before we get to the interview. I had a lot of fun talking to her. Like all of our guests, she gracefully suffered my half-baked questions and unfinished thoughts, but also did it with an infectious laugh that had me smiling the whole time we talked. And I can tell you, I needed that. I hope it does the same for you. Here's our new friend, editor and director, Yana Gorskaya. If that's true, if I can get all the fans, I'll be, I'll be, I'm doing okay. Um, <laughs> but before we talk about what we do in the shadows, the TV show, we should probably talk about the film that it was based upon. Uh, originally a mockumentary feature. So going back to that film, What We Do in the Shadows, how did Taika and Jemaine explain that project to you? And what do you recall about working on the film version of Shadows? I had actually worked with Taika um, from his very first feature. He has Kiwi editors that he works with as well. But I've been um, really blessed to have the opportunity to work with him in in small ways and in larger ways on on different films of his. And he explained what we do in the shadows. And I come from a documentary background. So it seemed right up my alley in terms of the meeting of the things that I love, comedy and documentary. And um, so he explained it to me and I was like, I need to work on this. (laughs) And he said, okay. okay." Uh, And he um, gave me a shot at it and sent me all of this uh, material that they had already assembled into a a rough cut. and I dug in and chiseled away, and it was so fun. I mean, they had um, they wrote a script, but they didn't show it to any of the actors, so it was completely improvised. And they just threw out all these ideas, and it was just they'd have an idea, and then they'd run and go shoot that. It was just um, there was so much material, and there probably a bajillion versions of that movie that would be great. Um, and then Taika and Jemaine came here to my studio and we worked together shaping it further. And we did a bunch of really small group screenings, testing different jokes, different versions. Um, and eventually 
through my work and the work of two other editors in um, New Zealand, uh, it took shape and uh, it was a blast. Before I move on to the next question, you brought up the screenings and going through different versions. That's something that you generally have the luxury of in films is going through screenings and getting audience reactions and being able to refine your work based on that feedback. In television, not so much. I'm assuming for what we do in the shadows, a TV show, you don't have that source of feedback to work with. No, but what we do rely on is a really unconventional workflow, which is that I co-edit and we all co-edit. So I primarily work with this editor who is a genius, Dane McMaster, on um, what we do in the shadows. And Dane and I hand in hand co-edit and then Above and beyond that, we bring our assistant editors, Antonia DeBarros and Varun Vishwana, into the room and we watch the cuts and then do a notes pass based on that. So everybody has input. It's a very open room. And then we also have incredibly smart EPs, Jermaine Clement, Paul Sims, Stephanie Robinson, and Sam Johnson, who give fantastic notes and help shape the material and are all really familiar with the universe and the tone. And we're all looking for something deadpan and grounded and funny. And so we're, everyone's on the same page, which is, I mean, mostly, (laughs) Um, uh, but everyone's really smart and has a lot to bring to it. And so there are a lot of eyes on the show and a lot of versions. It, It has a kind of, meteor post schedule than most television shows because there is so much improv and like art research that needs to be done and piecing it together is more time consuming than a more conventional sitcom. Well, there's been no shortage over the years of TV series that were adapted from films and they failed miserably because an idea or a setup that works within the confines of a 90 minute movie, it just can't hold an audience over the life of a TV series. What do you see as those key differences that just give the TV series this momentum that has made it a fan favorite for two seasons now? Uh, Fantastic writers and fantastic actors who bring so much to it. And then above and beyond that, because so much of the original team is involved or was involved at the get-go, you have the same DP in DJ Stipson and the same costume designer in Amanda Neal. And then I'm an editorial, Jermaine um, at the head. I, a lot of the tone and the look and feel, if you watch the What We Do in the Shadows movie and then you transition to the TV series, you can see that they're part of the same universe, that they have a similar comedic sensibility. Even though it's, it has its broad moments, the humor is deadpan. (laughs) It's still in the same, um, it's tonally of the same world. And I think that's what makes it work is that it's true to its source material. It's silly. (laughs) (laughs) It's silly. And it's, um, I I think one of the things that I love about it so much is that there are a lot of different comedic tools that you have to draw from. I mean, the dialogue and the delivery of the lines is hysterical. Um, The situations themselves are very funny. I mean, just for example, I mean, you could have the married vampire couple of Nadja and Laszlo just having that married couple argument and the lines they're throwing at each other are are a riot. Or you could have Mm -hmm. energy vampire Colin Robinson sucking the life out of a conference room, giving his PowerPoint presentation. And that's just an absurd situation. And then you have these great visual gags like, you know, the bear and vampire eating a piece of pizza and then just projectile (laughs) vomiting himself all over a parking lot. There's just all kinds of different things you can draw from that appeal to different sensibilities, I guess. Do you find that as you're working on an episode that you look for that balance? You look to say, okay, am I, are the jokes really coming mostly from the dialogue or the situations or visual gags or do I try and balance that out? Yeah. I mean, I think we just look for the funny, um, the things that genuinely make us laugh. And because, they shoot so much material. We have very long initial assemblies. So it becomes about chiseling it down to what's the funniest. And that's not always the biggest thing or the, or the big um, VFX driven thing. So sometimes we'll protect for a small joke that just happens to be 
really grounded and funny over something more spectacular. Uh, (laughs) uh, So yeah, it's about a shared sense of humor amongst the EPs and the writers and the actors and the editorial team coming together into what makes an episode. And part of, you know, shaping that down is a lot of art and art research and photoshopping of our characters who's done by the fabulous Holden Ward, part of our team. And this season, uh, Varun and Antonia, our assistant editors, also edited. They're both really far on their way to becoming full-fledged editors themselves and unfortunately will not be my assistant for for much longer. We also had Daniel Hayworth um, edit for uh, three episodes while I was directing the season and he killed it. It's just a fantastic group. Very smart, very funny people that I work with. I'm probably getting ahead of myself a little bit, but since you brought up the assistant editors, Every editor has their idiosyncrasies of how they like things set up, but what are the certain things that you like done for you as the editor? Well, uh, we it's shot on two cameras, so grouping and scripting is a big part of it. But our assists above and beyond that are huge creative collaborators, so we really like it when they mark material they think is funny, Um, point out things we might have missed and are very much engaged in the creative shaping and thinking of the show. I will never turn away a good idea. (laughs) Um, And they have many. What else? Uh, We do also do kind of an unusual thing when scenes have some difficult sound issues. They will group the sound so that I can right-click through different microphones rather than going back to the source to dig out individual mics, which is a huge time saver and can really let us shape the scene sonically. We work with a fantastic sound team that always makes it much better. But um, from the start, sometimes you really want to focus on a character or a line is missed in the overall mix and we need to dig it out. And that grouping that they do is, so cool. Well, I'm glad you brought up that process and that technique because I tend to forget to ask questions about some of the more practical aspects of editing a show because I love to focus so much on the story components and the editor's role helping to to refine the story, not just edit together what it says in the script. So we probably should talk about the overall workflow of an episode of what we do in the shadows, at least in terms of where your work begins as as an editor on the show. Well, I honestly, I come in and it's pretty plug and play. They, um, Antonia and Varun have set it up. And this season, we also had Alexis working as an AE with us because Varun and Antonia were also editing. And I come in and it's, it looks great. (laughs) (laughs) They make my job incredibly easy. And another process, an an unusual part of our, um, of the way we organize things is we have a bin in our scenes folder where we have the AE's make a two cut bin and then they also set up bins that say in progress and done and that's because we share episodes so dane and i will dig in and just kind of randomly pick scenes and episodes that need to get cut and then as we're working on them we put them in the in progress folder so that we know oh dane's working on that i shouldn't touch it <laughs> and then, um and then when we're done with an initial cut of a scene we put it into the done folder so we all know where we're at uh, with every episode and can track that. Um, And that's a, a, I don't know of other shows that work that way, but it works really well for us. Yeah, that sounds like a very organic way of dividing and conquering and leads me to another question, which is whether it's within a single episode where you're co-editing or throughout a season where you're doing an episode and another editor is doing another one, how do you determine, how do you decide who works on what, whether it's episodes or, or scenes? You know, I work a lot with Dane and with other editors I've worked with in the past, and we just have a very unconventional, all hands on deck approach. Normally, editors will take an episode and focus on that episode and be married to it. But what happens when you only do one is you have insane days where you're 
trying to meet a deadline and then days where you're kind of waiting around, waiting for notes. <laughs> um, and we found that if we all attack it and are all familiar with the episodes, not only do they turn out better, but it isn't that insanity of trying to meet a deadline and it isn't the waiting around. So we're, we're constantly working. There's always something to do because you're not waiting for notes. You're, you can go on to the next one because it doesn't have anybody's name on it. It's, <laughs> you know, um, so um, it's kind of a, everybody gets into the sandbox and, and can put their hands on things. I don't feel particularly territorial about which scenes I take or what parts of episodes, there will occasionally be something I really am itching to do. Um, and I'll just put it in the in progress folder. So I know I get to, t- <laughs> 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 no, I know I get, I know I get to do it, but um, for the most part, it's sort of nice to be surprised. And sometimes you'll think a scene that you're, you're not so keen on cutting is actually ends up being the funnest thing in the show. So, you know, it's a bit of a crap shoot. <laughs> I don't know why Avid ever came up with locked bins. We should have just said we have a folder called in progress and you know, just don't touch it. If somebody's working on that, that's perfect. <laughs> so you had mentioned that, you know, your show is still quote unquote working. Uh, the finale is this coming week. And we're still putting this effects in uh, this weekend. <laughs> that is scary. I mean, that's, well, you know, it, it wasn't designed that way. Um, our, our post producer is amazing, Ingrid Legator. Um, she managed to very quickly turn this into a remote operation, um, but because of some pretty extraordinary um, challenges, you know, our schedule has been pushed quite a bit. Everyone's far flung. Everything takes longer, including most especially VFX, which is so. Um, data hungry, but she's made it work. She figured it out. And we have this every, uh, every morning at 1030, we get together on a zoom and just talk about what we have going for the day and what needs to be done. I mean, the editorial part of it is basically done, but the um, VFX and sound and music and everything is kind of up to the last moment. We just mixed um, the finale this past week and um that's airing very very soon wednesday i think yeah Yeah, not a moment too soon (laughs) yeah if you had to guess or to prognosticate going through this experience of having to work remotely do you think there's anything that's going to uh, maintain once we get back to sort of at least being close to being able to do things in the old manner do you see any conventions moving forward from this that that, you know hey we can do things like this this way or or maybe this is a better way to do things moving forward well, there are certain advantages for sure. I mean, not losing commute time. And um, I, I mean, we were really lucky in that our um, assistant editors were so solid and were able to work this out in a way that our systems are still syncing. And, you know, we didn't hit hardly any technical snafus, which is a minor miracle given what's happening. And that's all due to them. And, um, Bravo. <laughs> I don't even know how they did it. It seemed like magic. Um, yeah, everything has worked. Um, we're all, I mean, we did have the benefit of already being a bit of a remote workflow show in that our EPs are in New Zealand and New York uh, and had been dialing in and looking at things remotely already in Atlanta. Um, so, so that part of it had already kind of been worked out, but the rest... Ingrid threw together and our assistant editors rocked it. So yeah, it does work. That Some really cool things like Matt Barry, who plays Laszlo on the show, used to have to travel two hours to go record his ADR because he lives sort of out far <laughs> from, <laughs> from uh, any studio. But he has a home studio because he's a voiceover artist as well. And so he's been, they've all been doing ADR in their closets. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, recording this stuff, but uh, Matt sounds amazing and he should not have to travel two hours in the future. Like that's something, that's a that's a learning curve thing that um, hopefully will stick. That's a whole new show, What We Do in the Closets. Uh, that's what we cool. do in the closets, yeah. So the, with the finale coming this week, 
Um, you know, the finished product generally is roughly a 25, 30 minute sitcom. You've talked a few times just about the workload. Is there an average for how long an episode takes from start to finish? We um, are kind of churning away because the production process on the show is really intensive. They're working nights. They um, have ambitious scripts for the schedule that they have. And so those are long days and nights. And um, it's very, very draining for the EPs. And so they're not really able to meaningfully take part in the shaping of episodes until production is wrapped. So just because it's so full on. And that gives us a fairly cush schedule. So we're just kind of banking. We're cutting and banking to sort of wait until they can catch up with us. (laughs) Um, And so we have stuff ready, you know, to sit with. um, Yeah, it's a longer schedule. (laughs) I don't, I can't even tell you, you'd have to ask Ingrid. She's, uh, she's on top of it. Um, But basically, we're given the time that we need to make it great. I would have to say that it probably is at least a good 50% longer per episode than your average sitcom. But I, I don't have hard numbers for you. I'm sorry. That's okay. We're, I can is, go look, I'll dig up a post schedule. But. This, this is not a hard numbers kind of show. We just, uh, <laughs> we just play it by ear. Uh, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the editing style of the show. Because it is in that mockumentary style, does that afford you any sort of freedom? I guess like I'm thinking in terms of the jump cuts. Like there's, since you have oh, this yeah. sort of convention, you can break a lot of rules. You can jump around a little bit. How does that play out in terms of your editing style? Well, it's a gift. Um, it's it's a it's a gift from the comedy gods because we can nail timing with a jump cut. And if something is running long, it's very easy to pace it up because continuity is no longer a big issue for us. I mean, we do pay some attention to that, of course, but <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's actually can be funny when a character is in a completely different position saying something different. <laughs> <laughs> from one moment to the next and you get a sense of passage of time and you can land a killer joke um, with those tools. It's very freeing. I love it. Watching the show and knowing how strong the writers are, how much improv is actually done compared to how tight the scripts are that you get? Yeah. Um, it, it depends a little bit on the director um, and how much they prioritize um the improv over um, getting what's on the page. We always get what's on the page and sometimes you end up just going right back to that. And then the improv is very much based on what's on the page. So it's related, but it all fits together. And the writers are on set and they're throwing out ideas also. So it's it's not like we suddenly abandon the script <laughs> and go in a completely different direction. They're very much a part of it and shaping that. But um, yeah, I would say... Shows are probably about 20% improv and 80% scripted. And that balance can can run the gamut from like 90% scripted to 40% scripted, mm. <laughs> depending, depending on, um, but always based on that Bible of, uh, of that script that, that comes in. So yeah, d- different episodes have just different runs. And sometimes the best stuff is the, when they just kind of riffed on an idea and just dug in and had fun with something, you know, when I was directing, I tried time permitting to always protect for a final take where, okay, we got the script, we got it. Now just try anything you were wanting to try. And maybe if something particularly had made me laugh that they were toying with to like, and and play with that idea. And um, the, the real gold can come from that too. So did I hear you say that you use script-based editing for this as well? Yes, but with the improv, yeah, we didn't torture our assistant editors with typing all of that out <laughs> because it would have taken forever. We would just be like goat improv and then like a star, <laughs> you know, for for like all the for all the places you could find the goat improv. Um, we tried to keep it not. They didn't have to do word for word transcription on the improvisation because they wouldn't have had time for anything else and um, we needed them. And that was plenty useful. You know, another staple of the show are these cutaways to artwork 
that supports what is being said by a character. And the artwork itself is just hysterical on its own. But you have to wonder where that artwork comes into play. Do you have that already when you're editing? Or do you decide during editorial, hey, we need a funny picture here for this gag to help punch it up? Some of them are scripted. And others are just us thinking, oh, it would be great to do a painting here. And it's also sometimes a way to get through story or um, illustrate something that we needed to land a little harder um, for comprehension or humor. Um, And uh, we go in and there's a lot of public domain art libraries and we research them. And sometimes that's me, sometimes that's Dane, sometimes that's um, RPA, Amelia Marino, sometimes that's Holden. Um, Varun and Antonia also do research and find cool paintings. It's, It's kind of a bit of all hands on deck And then we're all kind of keeping eyes out for funny art that might relate to the show in our lives uh, when we're not working on it. (laughs) So So all of that is found in terms of like, you don't actually go out and and consign? uh, We do sometimes as well. Um, Yeah, there are artists that have um, painted very specific tableaus. And sometimes we take existing paintings and paint the faces of our vamps into them. And that's true with photographs as well. Um, So yeah, a lot of that is scripted. And then we go and find that painting or that photo as a team in post and weave it in. Is there an offline online component to that where you might go in and just sketch out like, okay, what would be funny here is something like this. Let's just slug in some picture that's not on point or something you sketched or your assistant sketched. And then you go out and find the, the finished piece. Well, sometimes, although it kind of activates my OCD. <laughs> so, so we like to have something that basically works or is good. And sometimes we find a painting that improves on it. But um, yeah, we kind of do the research right away. Um, and I will leave it alone until we have the pictures. Yeah, so we need Nandor on his horse and... Um, Amelia sets off and finds a bunch of them and I'll find a bunch and I can't really cut it until I have the pictures to make the comedy of it work. Over to the in progress bin it goes. Yes. <laughs> Move on to something else. That's what's great. Like, you know, time isn't wasted. It's just put a pin in that. I need a picture. <laughs> well, whether, whether it's the in progress bin or the um, improv markers, uh, do you have any techniques that you use for managing the media, managing the story, whether it's color coding, versioning, anything like that? Well, one thing we do is that everyone, everyone on our team, Varun, Antonia, Dane, and I have chosen a color of marker to be the color of our voice and we'll leave markers for each other on a timeline because we're sharing cuts and um, co-editing. I will leave my colors pink. I picked it. Nobody imposed it on me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave pink markers and I'll say, Dane, these two other takes were good for this, check them out. Or they did a run of improv on this that might be worth digging into. It's at the end of the sequence. Um, And then we'll leave, um, we'll cut alts for each other that we generally don't show the directors on this show. Um, Although we have worked with directors like Jeff Blitz in the past who really likes to see alts. And uh, we'll let the other editor choose the version that ends up in the cut. <laughs> um, so, you know, if I think there's maybe three really funny versions of a joke, I'll put them together and Dane will go, well, that one made me laugh the hardest. And then you have like a second pair of eyes making that call. And we do a, a little marker at the end that we call spare bits of other pieces that were just really good from the scene that we assembled so that the other editor is aware of it. And if it feels like, oh, that really has merit and should be included that they can They can use those pieces without having to watch absolutely everything, which we do. Somebody watches absolutely everything. But, you know, on the second pass, when your co-editor is going in, they don't have to because hopefully you've pulled all the good stuff for them. I watch everything. I love this show. (laughs) So these are all interesting little processes and techniques that you have. Have there been any, I guess, significant changes or I guess even minor changes to the workflow between season one and season two? Anything you you learned from in season one or just new tools that became available. You said, okay, we're going to do it a little differently now in the second season. Hmm. No, it's very similar in terms of setup and workflow. One thing that changed was that 
we've been a lot more careful about making sure our art sources are public domain <laughs> so, that we, so that we don't have to recreate quite so many um, paintings. Last season, we had to commission a lot more paintings because we found things that were perfect, but we couldn't license. Um, <laughs> so, so that's changed. But in terms of like an avid workflow, that would be a question for Varun, honestly, more than me. Um, he's on top of it. Well, note to self, call Varun. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, then, if I could give you my perspective and you can verify or challenge it, you know, as a fan of the show myself, it seems to have evolved from season to season in terms of scope uh, and effects. Oh, yes. S certainly in the episode. There's a you, lot more VFX. Oh, yeah, season, a ton. Like sure. in the episode you directed with Mark Hamill, which I'm very excited to talk to you about in a minute, um, and also the last one you edited, uh, Witches, which was just loaded with effects. Um, yeah. you know, go, again, going from memory, it seems that in season one, especially the early episodes, the comedy came largely from the dialogue and the juxtaposition of, you know, the vampires and these mundane situations that everyone can relate to. Mm -hmm. When you get into a more VFX heavy workflow process, whatever you want to call it, how does that affect your editorial process? You know, either you as the individual or the overall post process? Well, it's definitely a bit longer to finish episodes with um, quite so much outstanding VFX work. It hasn't changed our editing process significantly. There was a lot of VFX in season one, too, and some of it was invisible. We're removing all the vampire breaths and reflections. These are things that nobody notices or sees as VFX, but I hope they appreciate subliminally that we're following the vampire lore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and then last season with the trial episode, which had all these phenomenal guest stars, they were all shot individually and not together. So it was a VFX bonanza to make it feel, and editing challenge to make it all feel like they were actually talking to each other and in the same room. So things that you didn't necessarily think were the effects in season one actually were. <laughs> but, um, yeah, definitely a much more ambitious VFX season um, for us. And of course, with the pandemic, that's been especially challenging, but they look great. I'm, I'm really happy with uh, they, they do. how it's all come out. Well, certainly one big change this season is, and we've hinted at this a few times, you directed a couple of episodes. Is that something you had wanted to do for a while? And how did that come about? Yeah, I have always wanted to also direct. I certainly don't want to only direct. I really love editorial and it's very much my happy place. So I, I don't want to come out of the cave for too long. But um, when I do, it's it's been a tremendous opportunity. Um, you know, Paul Sims and Jemaine thought that it would be a good idea that I really know the world. And um, I have directed before on um, the show Trial and Error that I also co-edited with Dane. And uh, they really liked that episode and thought it would be a good risk to take, I think. <laughs> I'm so happy that they did. Um, it was wild to actually be on set. And, um, you know, I showed up and I, I really thought that I'd be like welcomed with open arms because I'm the editor and I make them all look so good. And they looked at me with complete and utter blank expressions because they didn't know who I was. <laughs> and, um, and, and then they were like, why did you cut that out? Oh, no. <laughs> so it took me a little bit to gain their trust. But once that happened, they were awesome and just super game. And I think appreciated the fact that I understood the world and the history of their characters and didn't need babying to catch up with any of that. So yeah, it was a blast. And then of course, working with Mark. Yes. Dream come true. Yeah. I would have to imagine. Well, so I'm going to trot out a couple of well-worn questions I ask editors that direct your experience as an editor. Uh, in, in any way, do you feel like that helped inform your skills as a director? Anything you took with you from the editing room to the set? Of course. Uh, and, and some of it was almost instinctual in that I knew when we had it. It was a, it was a very um, full-on schedule uh, and extremely ambitious. And we had a full bar fight and we burned that bar down practically. <laughs> like, I mean, so um, it was a lot. And so really, I'd like to think that I was, uh, I didn't overshoot. Um, 
and I kept it moving and was able to get the story and the whole universe because, um, because of my editorial background. And then also I knew when I didn't have it. So to jump in and say, Hey, I think we need to pick up a talking head because that scene didn't quite land the way that we hoped. And that would be something I really want in editorial um, or, Oh God, we have to go get that insert or let's just pick up these two lines because the rest of it is great. Those kind of instincts I brought to it and a sense of the history of the show and the timing and you know, what we'll actually be able to use. <laughs> so. Well, it's funny you brought up the, the time to do things on set because one of the editors I talked to who directed said the thing that he was um, became aware of was, you know, as an editor, he's always thinking, why didn't you shoot this? Why didn't you shoot yeah. that? Where's this? And he's, once he's there, he's like, because you don't have time. You don't. Yeah. I, you get a lot less judgmental of the directors once you direct. That happened to me from the very first time that I did it. I was always like, God, why didn't they get this? Why did, you know? <laughs> like obviously you need this to tell this story, and there's a very um, simple reason, and there just isn't time. And everything is rolling. And then Dane and you know on that episode, Dane and Varun were the editors, and um, they saved me. They made me look really good. <laughs> they made me look, look like we had it. Okay, well, so in the inverse, you know, empathy aside, having that experience as a director. Did that teach you anything about working with editors or to change the way you approach being an editor? You know, I don't know that it did just simply because um, I was a lot more, you know, seasoned as an, as an editor um, before I directed. And so I, I'd had a lot of years under my belt. And I'd also spent a fair amount of time on sets with directors before as an editor, watching them work and bringing that into it. And, um, you know, I went to film school and all that stuff. (laughs) Um, I don't know that it changed much uh, in the way that I edit, but it certainly changed my feelings about missed opportunities um, and things that maybe went a little off the rails when working with directors, because I now appreciate how very, very hard their job is. It's, no joke. <laughs> uh, I believe you. Um, I've never, yeah. I've never done it. Every now and then, I do get to talk to editors who work primarily in documentary film or even other kinds of unscripted projects, like yourself. And of course, those are very challenging types of projects because, as the editor, you're not just building a story from the script and the director's vision. You literally have to find the story amidst these, yeah. these mountains of footage. Can that skill set and experience translate in any way into making you a better editor for scripted narrative-based projects? Absolutely. I think so. I mean, that's a lot of what I do when I come in as a consulting editor is not be married to what was on the page and to be able to kind of see footage with um, out of context and how can we repurpose a scene um, to mean something different by shifting the focus or turning it into montage or um, yeah, it loosens you up and makes you keep an eye out for pieces that maybe weren't designed to go together, but organically fit well. That comes from my documentary background for sure. I think absolutely have to play out in in the mockumentary style of um, what we do in the shadows. You know, other than than the technique and the craft, we often talk about the importance of relationship building and networking, especially early in an editor's career, because it is so common, as you've done with Taika, for a director to build a rapport with certain crew members and to work with them on all their projects. You know, I know this is really a question for him, but what is it about the way you two work together and your your skills and sensibilities do you think that has created this trust and and bond between the two of you? You know, I think it's that I'm a fan. I, I, I think... Well, the very first time I came in on Eagle versus Shark, I, you know, I came in as the the editor, this the studio brought in to help kind of shape a couple small things. It was already great, but I already it was already great. Like I, I already enjoyed his voice, and I wasn't trying to take over or turn it into something that it wasn't. And I just came and said. I think your film is wonderful. Maybe there's these few ways that we can play with and explore. And he was so into that. And then his um, 
his mom is a Russian Jew and I'm a Russian <laughs> Jew. And so I think, um, I think like the food we, we bonded over and um, he was actually staying on the same block, like right next door to where I was living at the time. And I, I it just felt like family very, very quickly. Um, that old pierogi and borscht connection. I hear that so yeah. many times. <laughs> um, it was, yeah, it was just a really comfortable relationship. And he is so free in the way he treats his own material. Like he is happy to be surprised and to do something different um, and to throw it in the air and see how it comes down and just, you know, and sometimes it won't work and we'll go back and um, undo all of it. But at least um, he's always game to try. Uh, and I've been really fortunate to work with directors like that. Um, Jeff Blitz is another one who is so open um, about experimenting and seeing something different than how he planned it. Well, are you are you familiar with a, a term or a phrase called the Yana Pass? <laughs> is it? Is that a thing? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Well, so you brought up, you know, we were talking about the relationship with Taika Waititi. Um, we talked about your role as a consulting editor, which seems to happen quite a bit. So that says a lot about what people think of your opinions. Uh, a while back, I was speaking with a certain Kiwi editor, Tom Eagles, when we were talking yes, about Jojo Tom. Rabbit. Yeah, and, he's uh, brilliant. He, he is, and he was a lot of fun to talk to. And we were just talking about... Um, the team on Jojo Rabbit. And this is what, um, when I asked Tom about the team, this is what he had to say. Oh, cool. I should also name check um, some other people, some of our additional editors, um, Alan Baumgarten and Jana Goskaya. Jana's been with Taika since the get-go, really, and she always comes in and does a couple of weeks of just a, a full Jana pass on, on the movie. Inevitably, by the time we bring her on, we've already experimented quite a bit with structure and... And with characters, if we want to reform a character. So it's really, a lot of it is being tough on jokes. It's always a way to get a fresh perspective and kind of test your assumptions on a film. So that was a wonderful opportunity for us. And this time, for the first time, I was able to be in the in the same building with her for a little while. It was really nice to have another editor to bounce off and talk about the film with. So there's Mr. Tom Eagles explaining the Yana Pass. <laughs> So yeah. th I thought that was really interesting about, um, he, he certainly keyed in on the jokes and that element of it. Is that, um, well, let me just get your perspective on it. So going in and, and looking at a film like Jojo Rabbit, what are you looking for? I guess it doesn't even have to be Jojo Rabbit, but as a consulting editor, what do you feel like your role is and, and how do you try and, and dig in and help out as best you can? Uh, goodness. You know, I, I usually have a conversation um, with Taika or the director beforehand in terms of, what's working for them and what they wished were better and kind of let that guide me. And then I sort of turn on um, my bullshit detector really high <laughs> like, um, and try and cut all of that out. Anything that doesn't feel genuine to me, I'll try and lift or rework. Um, but with Taika and his editors, it's, highly collaborative and very, very friendly. I never come in and just go, okay, this is, we're going to do the Yana version of the movie. Like, <laughs> it's not, not, like I would, Yana cut? no, like, um, it's not like that at all. It's, um, it's just, oh, here's some new ideas and well, maybe check this out. And like, is this useful? And, um, you know, here's a rethink in the end. I, I did, um, I think eight weeks on Jojo and that was in and out for different um, pieces of it. And that was such a pleasure. And Tom is so brilliant and he was the maestro that kind of worked my pieces in and out. And um, it was great. Well, clearly it all worked pretty well. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I would say I know, but I, I don't know, I, but I'm, I hear um, that you went to Columbia University and USC School of Cinema and TV. So, so clearly school's not really your thing. Um, but <laughs> My what, mom was a teacher, so... A little bit of better. Yeah. <laughs> that helps. Yeah. But what I really want to know is what you see as the beginning of your journey as a filmmaker. What was the defining moment or influence or, or person that started you off on this path? 
Uh, you know, I uh, came to this country as a political refugee, refusenik, and my grandfather was a director. Um, he directed the Leningrad Comedy Art Theater, uh, and my mom had wanted to be a director in the theater as well. But as a woman and a Jew, those doors were closed to her, and so. I always loved theater and I always loved film, but I thought when I went to Columbia that I'd be doing something more like political science. Like I wanted to change the world. Um, you still then, can. <laughs> definitely. The world needs to, I mean, I don't know if I can do it, but I'll, I'll try and do my part. But um, yeah. And then I discovered the film program and then it was like, Oh, this is a meeting of things that I love tech and creativity um, and I became a film major as an undergrad, but, you know, Columbia is not a very hands-on undergrad film program. So I still felt like I didn't know anything <laughs> really when, I, <laughs> when I graduated. So uh, that's why I also went to grad school because I felt like I needed a deeper tech grounding in the tech of it all um, and the nuts and bolts of how you actually make a film. And while there I, I met they have an amazing documentary faculty. And I met Kate Amon, who became my mentor uh, as an editor. And she was so calm and smart and lovely and fulfilled. And I just thought, oh, my God, I want to be Kate Amon when I grow up. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, so and in editing documentary in that program, I just days with fly by and hours would fly and I didn't see them go. And it was such a pleasure that um, it just, I knew I'd kind of come home um, through graduate school. Well, before we move on from talking about the film school experience, and especially now that I've learned that your mother was a teacher, I would love to know your thoughts on what you feel should be emphasized in film school beyond the social aspects and the relationship building but you know, if, if I'm um, if I'm a faculty member, or professor, teacher, whatever, if I'm trying to best prepare my students for a career in the industry, what should I make sure to teach them? You know, I think the best advice I ever heard was um, from Sally Menke, <laughs> um, Tarantino's editor who passed away, and that was um, keep your overhead low so that you have the freedom to say no. Uh, and to work with people and on projects you actually believe in. Try to live below your means as much as possible. I still drive a Honda Civic. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> because you can. You can uh, drive those cars forever. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's, it's so that I don't have to take a job to make a car payment. I want to take a job because... I love something and I really want to work with someone. Um, and that's definitely, you know, sometimes we just have to work, but, you know, like I'm, I'm in a position of privilege, but, um, but I will continue to do that. <laughs> um, and um, to really like um, this mantra of good people, good projects, and that you are worth something and that, you know, even if you're working for little or no money in the beginning to build your resume, that your work has a lot of value. And so please do it with people you actually genuinely like and on things you actually genuinely like, because you'll continue to work with those people and, and continue to work on those kinds of projects that you sort of start out with. So build it in a way that you want to build it and be careful about those choices. That's great advice. So you've toughed it out with me for almost an hour, which is amazing. <laughs> That's not, it's not an easy thing to do. So I'm going to, I'll, we'll do one last question. Mm -hmm. um, whether you're changing the world or not, uh, if you weren't working in film and television, what do you think you'd be doing? I'd be writing. Um, I'm co-writing a book with my writing partner, Maya Rossini, who is my best friend from grade school. 
and who I adore and um, yeah, would happily spend every day with. <laughs> no friend like an old friend. Yeah. You know, new friends are pretty damn good too. So try and make more of them when you can. A big thank you to our friend in the shadows and the edit bay, Yana Griskaya, for her time. I hope you enjoyed our visit with her and hearing about how she edits and directs her show as well as her career. I know I certainly did. Keep your overhead low. I try to do that myself, especially lately. If you want to do that and learn about Media Composer, I can offer you a tip on that. There is an absolutely free version of Media Composer called Media Composer First, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes. It is a great way to not only learn the Avid, but to tell your own stories. Make your own funny and or scary movies. Vampires has been done. Lord knows zombies has been done. Do one about, I don't know, do one about talking hamsters or something. God, I gotta get out of this house. There's gotta be something left. You'll figure it out. Whatever you do, do it for free with Media Composer first. Never stop learning. And if you can do it for free, all the better. That's a wrap on this one. Time to draw the shades and close the curtains before the sun comes up. Soon we will meet again to talk about editing and making movies and TV shows and all that stuff. But until we do, this is Matt Fury thanking you, my friend, for joining me right here on The Rough Cut.